Welcome to episode 413 of the AMPN podcast. My guest this week is Steve Yates. Steve is the founder of Prime Guidance. He's, he's been involved in e-commerce for quite some time, first with Dick's Sporting Goods, then working for Amazon, and now out on his own advising brands on how to sell on Amazon. He's not an agency that's necessarily doing it for you, although they have done a little of that from time to time temporarily, but mostly guiding people and big brands on why they should be on Amazon, what they need to do to get on Amazon, onto Target, onto Walmart, and all the different platforms. Great talk today about everything from liquidating inventory to controlling the buy box to getting your brand on Amazon if it's not on Amazon already or if it is on Amazon, what are some of the things you could do. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. So this is Steve Yates. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. E-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin, Kevin King. King. Kevin King. Welcome to the AMPM podcast, Stephen Yates. How are you doing, man? You're just right up the road from me. I'm good. Yeah, it's good to be on with you, Kevin. It's uh, uh, you're a legend, and I'm, I'm honored to be uh, alongside you. Um, and yeah, it's, it's funny. I didn't realize how close we were. Uh, both Texans. So, what brought you to Dallas originally? Then, what brought you to Texas? So, uh, I was working at Dick's Sporting Goods, and uh, Amazon relocated me to uh, to start a sporting goods category for Woot.com, one of their subsidiaries. Oh, so you were working for Dix and then Amazon hired you for Woo. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I remember Woo. Are they still around? Um, they are. Or they are? Yeah, yeah, that was, they did uh, like liquidation. Was it liquidation type of stuff and like deals, special deals of the day kind of thing, right? Yeah. So basically they were the, the leader in the space back when daily deals were so popular, flash sites. Um, uh, that's where Groupon and everybody else kind of follow in their footsteps. Um, they had a kind of a cult-like audience of people that would buy products from them uh, based on the confidence that they knew was always the best deal on the internet. So they shopped it. They they bought large quantities. You had 24 hours. So there was like a, an impulsiveness. You've got to buy it before it's gone. And a lot of items would sell out even early in the morning. So people would wake up at midnight, you know, and try and be the first to grab products and stuff. Um, I think over time, customers fatigued on that model. But Amazon's used them for a lot of other things like, you know, liquidating their own products and, and, uh, Woot is actually one of the sellers on, on Amazon today doing pretty sizable business also. Yeah. I've lost, I, I remember them back in the mid, like 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, mm-hmm. kind of burst on the scene. It's W O O for those of you listening. Uh, if you're wondering what we're saying, what, what's he saying? Who or who? Um, W O O T.com. Yeah. Woot. Yeah. Yeah. W O O T. Um, I haven't actually checked on late, so I wasn't even sure if, they like you said, you know, Groupon was a hot thing back around then too, and people were selling products, not just you know dental certificates and uh, free hamburgers or whatever, but uh, uh, there's th- those two guys were competing head to head, and a lot of that was the thing. Like now, everything is get on TikTok. Back then, everything is like try to get on Groupon or try to get uh, get your products on Woot if you got some excess inventory. Yeah, it's still actually a great place for sellers that they have a product that's just not moving very well, but it's well reviewed. It's well liked by customers. And, and for some reason now the competitive landscape may have changed on Amazon and they're stuck with a bunch of inventory. It's still a great channel to uh, sell products. And because they're owned by Amazon, there's actually this process uh, called an IOG inventory flip that Amazon can kind of take possession of that inventory without ever, even having to pull it out of Amazon FBA warehouses. Uh, they can basically just buy it from you and keep it in those warehouses. So how does it work then? So if, if someone, if, if I have some excess inventory I want to get rid of, do, do I contact Woot? Do I contact uh, my SaaS rep at Amazon? Do, what do yeah. I do? Woot. Woot. Woot's the one that you'd want to contact. Basically, they have teams of buyers. Uh, I started their sporting goods category, uh, sports and outdoors. Um, um, and uh, uh, they have buyers for each different category, home goods, electronics, et cetera. And you need to reach out to either one of their buyers or through a sales rep group that has a good relationship in there. And they can basically pitch the product, say, here's how many quantity we have. Here's the price that I can sell it to you. And uh, here's when the product's available. Amazon or Woot. You know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, how do Amazon.com 
uh, email address, got paid by Amazon, you know, Amazon RSU. So I, I speak of it as, you know, just working at Amazon uh, because they have so many different subsidiaries and they're all really well connected. But you'd reach out to, to, to them and they would do an evaluation. How is this thing selling? If we lowered the price, they have forecast models to know what the sales velocity would be. And then they can decide, is this a daily deal where I can sell $250,000 of that product in a day and just be done with it? Or is it something that's going to be a part of a flash sale where they'll put it as, as part of a collection and sell it over a period of time, usually a week or two? So what kind of discount do I need to be looking at? Is it 10 cents on the dollar kind of thing? Or what, what no. should I be looking at to, uh, to try to move? If I got a thousand units sitting at Amazon and I got another 2,500 in my 3PL and I'm, just, I'm done with this thing, um, you're saying that they can handle the transfer internally of those thousand, uh, mm -hmm. however that, that works. And then I would just ship in the others and what kind of deal would I need or, to be pitching? Or they could even drop ship it, have you drop oh, ship okay. the, the remaining balance. So it depends on the velocity and whether they trust you to be able to do all the fulfillment yourself, but that is an option to, to fulfill it directly or ship it into to the same warehouses you have the inventory, but under different ownership. What kind of a discount am I looking at having to do? To yeah, do so it depends on the, the scope. Similar, think of Woot.com as like, a, a daily deal on Amazon. It's, it's got to be a pretty aggressive discount. If it's a daily deal, like 30% off the everyday price or more. And if it's a, uh, like a flash sale, a, a collection of products, probably in the 15, 20% off of the lowest price, but we're not talking just one sales channel. They will look all over the internet. And if you, they find a cheaper price, it's a no go because they built trust with their customers. So are they buying everything outright or is it just as a consignment deal? They can do both. So if they have a high confidence, they may buy it all outright. If it's uh, uh, something where they're just not sure if it's going to work, they would they would uh, take it on consignment essentially, and they can flip the inventory back uh, to you if they don't sell through it, depending on their level of commitment. Are individual people going to Woot and buying these? I'm buying one one uh, garlic press, two garlic press, or are these people buying in bulk? They're buying 10, 15, 20 units to supply their store or or something like that. It's almost all individual consumers going to the website, making individual purchases, but they do have wholesale teams because they will do things like liquidating uh, inventory for their own overstocks and Amazon overstocks um, uh, to wholesale relationships. And those are more of the suppliers uh, or the liquidators that they would they would have relationships with. So that whole industry, I mean, since we're going down this path, might as well talk about it a little bit. That whole industry, I'm, I'm assuming you know a little bit about outside of just Woot, the liquidation.com. Uh, I know here in Austin, there's a, a warehouse, uh, um, drawing a complete blank, I, I think it's Texas Liquidation, um, that I, I've actually sold some of my products to, just drove up there, you know, in, in, a, in a big U-Haul truck and, and dumped a bunch of stuff to them. That's a whole business that a lot of people don't even realize exists. Uh, a lot of sellers get stuck with stuff. And I, I was just uh, visiting a 3PL company um, up on the Northeast Coast uh, last week. And they're telling me they've got $180,000 on their books of unpaid uh, invoices from Amazon sellers who started a business and just for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And they just abandoned their inventory and didn't pay their storage bills, didn't pay their bills. So mm -hmm. they're having to, uh, you know, there's a, a series of uh, things they go through before they can do this, but they, they end up usually liquidating that stuff out or, or donating it. If you donate it, sometimes it's actually worth more than liquidating it because you can donate it at cost. Yeah. Uh, and write that off on your taxes versus selling it for 10 cents on the dollar. It may be actually better to, to donate it. Um, mm -hmm. So what that what what else is in that industry that you're aware of that who's like competing with Woot or what should what are some other options that when sellers get into a bind, uh, either they're going to close up shop or they just need to get out of some stuff. What are some other besides Woot? What are some other options that you know about there? So I, I have had a lot of experience in this category and uh, we've actually done consulting for some of the leading liquidators that are we're talking billion dollar brands. Um, that take returns from retail and liquidate them and, 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 and refurbish product and so forth. There's a lot of different options, but I would say for the average seller that you and I probably come across, contacting Wood is probably the, 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 the first thing I would consider. Um, there are other smaller competitors and there are some products that may do what better on Groupon or, or, or other similar sites. But if you're trying to move a large quantity in a very short amount of time, there's not much competition against Wood because that's kind of their, they, they kind of started the, the industry and they're still one of the leaders in the industry. Um, what we do oftentimes see success with is people that are um, uh, deal uh, oriented affiliate sites like slick deals. 
So if, mm-hmm. um, deal news, slick deals, you know, those types of websites, oftentimes it doesn't really matter if it's on a particular website, they're br- bringing attention to the product. They're getting a commission for advertising it and they will specify this is the lowest price we've seen or like deal, deal news. Anyways, they try and specify this is the lowest price we've seen by $10 or $20 or, or whatever it is. So the customers kind of said, someone else did the research for me. It, there's more built in trust. Um, and then you're paying them a commission uh, to or an affiliate commission, basically sending the traffic to, to either Amazon where Amazon's paying them the commission or uh, to your own website where you may have deeper discounts that you can offer and, and you would have to have an affiliate relationship with them uh, yourself. You mentioned that you, you, uh, some of your clients, so you run a company called Prime Guidance, right? Are your partners yeah. in that or what, what's no, the, uh, no, I, I founded it uh, back in 2014. So while you were still at Woot or you left Woot? Right after, yep. So I left left Woot and uh, founded Prime Guidance. I had a deep e-commerce experience uh, background. So basically I started in retail in 1992 in sporting goods retail, uh, grew, grew through management, moved into corporate office buying and uh, basically oversaw teams of buyers at uh, a company called GSI Commerce, which was uh, mm-hmm. bought out by eBay Enterprise uh, or bought out by eBay and l- renamed eBay Enterprise. Um, and it was an early stage startup that really took the internet by storm. And when I started there, um, there was I was employee number 40. And when I left 11 years later, uh, we had 3,000 or oh, wow. 5,000 employees, $3 billion in revenue. And we were running websites for businesses that you didn't realize were run by someone else. So when you went to DickSportingGoods.com, for example, we were the ones behind the scenes running it all and even buying all of the product and merchandising it for those websites. And over time, the business model evolved and we started just kind of operating the, the back end for these retailers, but not sourcing all the goods for them. And they expanded into companies like, you know, Ralph Lauren and, and other big brands. It was hundreds of brands that we ran. And uh, uh, that's when Dick Sporting Goods wanted to kind of take things back over and hired me to, to lead their e-commerce initiative. Uh, did that for a few years for the second stint at Dick's um, prior to Amazon. So I had a really deep uh, understanding of e-commerce and, and Amazon really gave me that marketplace experience. And I saw that there was a lot of sellers that didn't realize how much business they were leaving on the table. There were, you know, they're growing 30% riding on Amazon's, you know, coattails, thinking that all's great, high-fiving each other. But the reality is they were, uh, you know, under penetrated their market, they weren't growing in market market share and so forth. So um, I saw this kind of behind the scenes and, and realized that they're not optim- optimized, they're not doing all the right advertising tactics and so forth. And uh, I started assessing um, other uh, agencies that were out there, and they were all full service agencies, you know, just let us run it for you, we'll hire a team overseas and, and do it all. And, you know, Amazon kind of taught me that it was all about if you do what's good for the customer, then they'll, their loyalty and satisfaction will, will follow through. So I thought, well, let's do something different. Let's, let's not be like everybody else. Let's, let's create a consultancy where we can actually teach people how to succeed in this space and take on whatever they need us to augment. So instead of, uh, um, you know, for example, we help them build up their team, create roles and responsibilities and expand their team, teach them, train them one-on-one, not a training course or anything, and, and, and then if they, we understood that, hey, they, they're lacking in graphics or they're lacking in advertising or they're lacking in operational support or something, we would fill in those gaps, but with a, a lens of trying to truly fill in the gaps until they could fill in those gaps themselves and tr- truly created a, uh, a consultancy where we are a partner in their growth, helping them uh, succeed in, in marketplaces, not just Amazon, but Target and Walmart and eBay and others, and and we help companies expand globally. So that's that's what I founded back in 2014, and we've never advertised. A lot of people don't know us, uh, but we've helped hundreds of clients and uh, many uh, that are billion dollar brands, and uh, some of our clients do over 100 million dollars a year uh, just on Amazon. So we're kind of uh, running under the radar a little bit. Are these mostly when you come in? Are these people that already? have some deep pockets that are already doing something in other channels. And like, I don't know this whole e-commerce thing. You just kind of what you were doing when you're doing the websites, you just guide them through that. Or these startup guys that, Hey, I want to start up an Amazon business and uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, Cause it seems like two different, uh, two different approaches yeah. there. So it's interesting because if you ever talk to someone that runs a full service agency, the first thing they're going to ask is how much revenue are you doing? Because they're likely going to charge a percentage of your revenue. And what I uh, wanted to do was not have that 
tie-in. So it didn't really matter if you're a startup, a startup company or a multi-billion dollar brand, we could help you accelerate your growth. Now you have to be willing to pay a, a monthly engagement fee with us and that differs based on the scale. You know, do you need us to just provide you know, a small level of coaching and support you know, to help you grow your business or do you need us to fill in? Like we, we work with a lot of private equity firms where they, they will acquire a, a portfolio company and say, hey, can you help step in and, and lead this and, until we can build a team and get it off the ground um, and anything in between. Uh, but it's always monthly engagement fees. We don't charge a percentage of revenue. Um, and hence, we can help them understand how would we think about this business holistically? Should Amazon be where you start? Of course, most of the time that is the case, but it doesn't end there. What about Target? What about Walmart? What about uh, international growth? What about your retail channels? Are you doing the most? Like we'll help them uh, evaluate their product packaging and uh, we'll help them understand how do I get more customer loyalty and what's your what's your lifetime value of your customers? Uh, is it worth essentially losing money on Amazon at times because you have a subscription revenue product where you can generate all of this you know long term revenue because uh, those customers become loyal and are, are subscription customers, whether that's supplements or or electronics that have some sort of a subscription tie in. Uh, we help them holistically figure this this path out and get the most of all their sales channels, not just Amazon. So how many clients are you uh, typically actively engaging at any time or helping out? Yeah, somewhere in the 40-ish range, um, you know, during most, you know, most, most periods of time, um, but it, it varies. And we, because we don't have uh, long-term contracts, many of our clients come back to us again and again. So they, you know, we help them get off the ground and then they, they want to launch a new sales channel or, or expand international. They come back to us to help them with their next endeavor. So you're like you're basically like their own little private consultant that can just uh, that comes in uh, as needed uh, mm -hmm. and gives them that guidance of what they need to do next or how to set the systems up or the SOPs or whatever up. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, most of our clients, though, th th I mean, many of our clients, they uh, stick with us for years because they, they were constantly adding value, but in different ways. So we may not they may not need us to continuously help on Amazon anymore, but they'll They'll, they'll pivot and say, we need your help on, on Target or international expansion or, or what have you. Um, but uh, yes, we're, we're someone that's at their disposal all the time. They're, we're always going to be uh, basically suggesting what we would do if we were running the business for them. Um, uh, so you're not actually running it. Your team, unlike an, a typical agency that's actually doing the actual work, you're just saying this is what you need to do and this is who you should be doing it with and the, the procedure to do it, basically. Most of the time, yes. So there are times, like I mentioned, those private equity firms, they may make an acquisition and want us to run pretty much what I would call full service light. You know, we'll do everything except for like customer service and stuff. We don't employ anyone overseas. It's all domestic resources and they're all, you know, highly uh, paid experts that are truly you know, experts in their field and, and can do things 10 times faster than, than the clients can do themselves a lot of times. Um, uh, so uh, our, our sweet spot is partnering with them because they know their customer better than, they, than anyone else and they know their product better than anyone else, but they lack the marketplace insight. And a lot of times they spin their wheels. What do I do? Am I doing this right? And there's Amazon launched this new program. How do I get the most of it? Or they make mistakes and they get their account shut down or something else. And we become that partner in crime to say, we're going to get through this together. We're going to strategize. What's the, the path? What's the roadmap you need to have? What are the team members you need to have? What are the operational components and systems you need to have? What are the, the software providers you're partnered with? You know, are you doing all the right things? And then we just fill in the gaps because a lot of times, you know, clients come to us and they're really good at, at their marketing uh, like their creative design and and their product design and packaging and everything else, but they just they lack awareness on keyword research and and PPC advertising and DSP advertising and things that uh, that are new to them. They're not they're not yet good at that, so they need us to just kind of step in and fill the gaps originally and then teach them uh, along the way. And it may be that we run it for a while and then they take it over, or it may be that we just provide the coaching. A lot of the listeners to this are all in the Amazon space, so we think everybody knows Amazon, but it's not the case. There's still a lot of people and a lot of big brands that either are not on Amazon at all, or if they are, they've just dabbled a little bit and it's just a placeholder, basically, and they don't know how to do it. I was just, uh, uh, last when we we're recording this, I was just uh, last night at uh, um, Big Commerce. They're based here in Austin, uh, the software platform. It's kind of like a Shopify, if you're not familiar, and they, they're hosting an event and they had a little happy hour. I was at this uh this happy hour and there's quite a few agencies there that all they do is help people on Shopify 
and they they were telling me uh, or shop not or not shop uh, uh, big commerce um, and Shopify, and they they were telling me that they have a lot of clients that that want to go to Amazon, but they don't know what to do. Uh, they just they have no clue, and they they fumbled it around, or maybe hired some some intern uh, at one point to to try to manage it that really didn't have a clue. Maybe had a business degree, but still didn't really have a clue how Amazon works. So there's a big need for this out there, and there's a lot more of it, I think, than what people realize. There really is. In fact, it's really, it's kind of funny. It's some of the biggest brands that you think they've got their all their act together that they are so in their lane. They only know wholesale sales to retailers, or they know brand direct brand sales or something, but they don't know uh, other marketplaces. It's uh, completely foreign to them. And a lot of times, when that's the situation, they avoid it. They're like, no, we don't need to be on there or it's going to be disruptive to our our other retailers. So we're going to kind of stay away from it. Um, and that's oftentimes where they get into trouble. Um, like we've had clients where they've had 40 different sellers selling their brand. And it's the wild, wild west. They Everyone's selling for different prices to try and steal the buy box. There's, uh, there's, there's no added value for all of those added sellers to a brand. Um, and we'll, we'll help them understand how can you be the seller that has full control over your brand, build a channel control policy to keep these sellers off of the channel. If you want to authorize a few sellers, have a good map pricing policy, which is a minimum advertised price so that everyone's playing by fair rules. And, and, and only do that if you're going to have added value. I like to say, if you're a brand, you, you're selling to all of these people that each have their own stores that have foot traffic or they have their own e-commerce website. They're advertising in those markets. Do, and they're offering some sort of value, a reason for the customer to buy there. But on Amazon, not so much. It's it's really that your brand is searched and being purchased. And Amazon sellers don't or customers really don't even know who they're buying from a lot of times. And we we know it because we we know what the buy box means. A lot of customers, when you talk to them, they have no idea. They just think they're buying everything from Amazon. And uh, you, those are those are not added value uh, offerings unless you know there's a strategic reason to have them. Uh, as added values, like, you know, inventory, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a poor job managing inventory yourself. You need others to kind of fill in the gaps, but it's it's real messy. Um, and a lot of times we'll help them along that journey of controlling the channel and, and building the brand the way they need to. So it's well portrayed on Amazon and then accelerating it. And we've had uh, some examples where we've helped clients save over $3 million in EBITDA just by taking control themselves versus selling wholesale on Amazon and, and, when they could be selling at the full retail price on Amazon and, and actually doing a better job presenting their brand. So um, uh, I forget the original question you you asked, but I think I, I didn't fully you answer got, you it. Got, you got it. Okay. Uh, you got it. Good. Um, so a lot of these big brands, you said some of them, they just they stick in their lane. That's what they know. And they're kind of afraid to go over. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. are some of the reasons do that do a lot of big brands and a lot of brands just still see Amazon as a a flea market as a, you know, that's where, that's where the cheap prices are. And we're not a cheap brand. We're a prestigious brand or we're a luxury brand or whatever. So we don't need to be on there, even though 60 plus percent of all e-commerce sales are made on Amazon. Uh, uh, that's not just marketplace. That's across the board. Um, and it's the shop a card of choice. It's first place people, most people go to look for something. What is that still in today's world, that resistance from, uh, for a lot of them to, to make that leap over? Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's less of a, oh, it's Amazon. We don't want to be associated with them like it used to be. It's more of a, uh, a fear that that's a channel that is scary and out of control, in my opinion. And I, I, I also don't want the perception that I'm selling either direct to customers. That's something that they, they, they don't want to look like they're, they're taking business away from their retailers, which I respect. Retailers should get, uh, like if they're going to put a big Nike uh, uh, portion of your store with all of this branding and special, you know, attention, um, you should be loyal to them and try and get business for them. But when it comes to Amazon, it's a different beast. And uh, uh, so that's one is they're afraid to, to be a, a seller themselves, or they're afraid of like hindering these relationships they've already been allowing to sell on Amazon. Um, some of the the, the, the the sellers that were authorized in some of our clients, were selling over a million dollars a year on brands that we're just letting them have at it. And when you go to them and say, hey, we're no longer going to allow you to sell on this channel, it can be really disruptive. It could potentially put them out of business. So it's something they don't want to take lightly. They need to have a strategy of how, how can I better support that seller outside of Amazon if I'm not going to allow them to sell on Amazon? And it needs to be a very thoughtful process 
Um, but I would say fear is is usually the the situation, not upsetting the apple cart. And a lot of times, big uh, big brands they move slow. You know, we think in Amazon age, you know, everything moves fast. You know, and that's something that Amazon run fast and they pivot fast, and I love that about them. But there's so many big brands and big retailers out there that, that certainly don't do that. If I'm listening to this and I'm going to go on to Amazon, I haven't been on there. Maybe, like you said, maybe there's 40 people selling my stuff now competing for the buy box besides map price, which stands, that means minimum advertised price. Uh, so that basically means that if you allow someone to sell, they can't sell it. They can't advertise it under another, uh, below a certain price. You can still sell it below that price, but you just can't advertise it at that price. That's why you see sometimes you have to add something to the cart before you actually see the price. Uh, so it's technically not advertised on, on some websites or in some deals. But besides that control mechanism, what other controls can you do you help them put in place to clean this up? And like you said, you're going to mm -hmm. some of these guys, you're going to knock them out of business. Uh, they, they may be that's their whole business model was buying your product and selling it online. Others, mm -hmm. they're just selling some stuff out the back door, some extra inventory or whatever, just as a separate mm -hmm. channel. But how, what are some ways that you can regain control of your brand besides just map price? Yeah, so it's easier said than done. It is not simple. Amazon used to aid in channel control to some limited degree. They used to let you message sellers and stuff and say you're not authorized to sell on the channel. They don't allow that anymore. You have to take everything offline. And one of the the, the ways that you can do it is uh, serializing your product. So if you have like Garmin products and you have a serial number on it, you know exactly who purchased that product and you can shut down their inventory supply and say that was not an authorized channel for you to sell. We ordered a test order. It has your serial number. We sold it to you two months ago. You're no longer going to have access to our inventory. And there's usually a, a, a multi-phase warning process. Amazon transparency or something different? In this case, it's their own serialization process. Okay. But okay. Amazon transparency is a really good fit, especially if you have any counterfeit issues. If you have counterfeit issues, it's the way to go because it essentially is that serialization. It's a QR code for those that don't know it. It's a QR code called the transparency code that uh, Amazon uh, operates and you apply that to every single product. Now, it's not just a, like a UPC code. It's the same for all of those products. It's an individual uh, uh, code behind it that's translated into a QR code and printed on the package or on a sticker that you apply to the package and then Amazon will not allow a seller to sell the inventory without scanning that inventory in or uh, ship it into FBA without them receiving it and scanning it and verifying that it's authentic. So if there's counterfeit issues, that's definitely the way, the way to go. If it's not counterfeit, there's nothing that Amazon will do to control it for you unless you're a Nike and you've got some special special privileges or, you know, someone which speaking, we should talk about with Nike because they, they're another big brand that's been fearful of Amazon. And there's a long story behind that. Um, but um, you really have to uh, do have a good monitoring process in place alerts when people sell, because you'll have people that will, will start selling your products in the middle of the night when you don't see it just to try and get around it. So you need to understand when do the products come onto the Amazon platform uh, if they are violating map, who violated first? Because a lot of these guys have repricers in place and there's a violator and a follower. And you need to understand those things. And then you need to work with your legal counsel or a, a company like Voris or something that can send cease and desist letters to those companies. They're very good at doing investigative work, finding out based on the business entity that Amazon discloses and doing some trailing who that seller is and, and, and kind of threatening them uh, from a legal standpoint. Um, but it, it is easier said than done. It's a little bit of a whack-a-mole process, but it can be done um, successfully. Um, it's just something that can't be done without um, persistence and the right tools and technologies. Now, that, there's a lot of people that you see them a lot of times. It's mostly the smaller sellers where they're like, oh, someone, I've got a hijacker on my account. That's a common term that's mm -hmm. used. And that's someone that's bought the product. A lot of times it's someone that's bought the product and are just reselling it. Um, and Or they, mm -hmm. they maybe got it from a deal uh, or a lightning deal, or they got it from someone was doing some sort of launch or rebate or or something that they that you're really not supposed to be doing, but uh, they they did that anyway. And they got it and they just turn around and resell it, and they 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 feel that that's counterfeit or that's illegal or something. But in the United States, you it's you have the right to sell, resell, uh, right. and so how do you knock somebody? So if I'm a brand, and how do I how do I prevent? I can't really prevent someone from selling. I can maybe prevent them from selling in bulk. I say, I'm not going to sell to you if you sell to Amazon. So I'm going to, or I'm going to cut you off if you turn around selling Amazon. But ultimately mm -hmm. you can't really control that. So it's, you just mentioned it. It's all about the cutting them off, Like you got to control the inventory supply. They're buying it from someone. A lot of times it's yeah. distributors. You're selling to a distributor. 
and that distributor is selling to anybody that wants to, to sell the product. And you need to control that distributor and say, you're only allowed to sell to these authorized sellers um, or, or something of the like. Um, if you know who they are, that's the hardest problem. It's just finding out who they are. If you know who they are, you should have already had them sign a channel control agreement. And they agree that if they violate that agreement, they don't have, uh, exp you don't, you've not given them express written permission to sell on any channel other than their e-commerce website or their retail stores, then they violate it. Here's what the penalty, you know, first phase, second, third, fourth, and eventually it leads to just cutting them off and they're no longer allowed to buy your brand at all. Um, that's the way you have to control the, the channel. And, and with map pricing, it's very similar in that you can't tell a retailer <clears throat> what they have to sell it at. All you can do is say, if you sell below this retail price, then I'm not, I'm going to take away some privileges. And one of those privileges might be that you have access to the inventory or maybe that they, they don't give you backend marketing funds that they were granting to you like co-op and so forth. Um, so there's penalties, but you can't, you know, due to you know, regulations, you can't tell them uh, what they have to price it at. I think one of the best companies out there and correct me if, if you know somebody better at controlling map pricing is Apple. I mean, Apple, I, I know Apple, I mean, one, they sell direct and they sell through their stores. They sell some things on Amazon, but not other things. Um, but they have maintained this high price point and heavily, heavily controlled that. And even their authorized dealers, I, I know a buddy, a buddy of mine owns a couple uh, authorized stores. Uh, they're not Apple stores, but they're authorized. You know, they, they do the repairs, and all that, so, but they also sell. And their margin is like 5% and, or something like that. And they're not allowed to, to, to sell it below that for any reason, uh, not even to liquidate it. Um, and so th they've done a really good job, I think. Uh, is there someone else that's done a really good job at, out there that's a good example of controlling uh, that map price? Some of the, some of the so Apple's by far the, the example I would lean on. There's other brands that have done a good job uh, controlling their price points, but Apple's the, the shining star. Everybody should lead by example. But the problem is, you're in a different situation when you are a powerhouse like Amazon, I'm sorry, like Apple, where they can't not have you. Like you don't want to go into a, a T-Mobile store and, and an AT&T store and say, I'm sorry, we only sell Android. You know, you, you that would be an embarrassment for them. They have to have Apple products available. And same thing with Best Buy and so forth. That's It's so uh, important to them that they will not violate it. You know, like I, I'm a big fan of Costco. I buy a lot of stuff at Costco. I had a, uh, uh, an accessory, an Apple accessory that I needed to return. I think it was, um, I think it was uh, uh, AirPods or something. And Costco, which will take back anything, said, oh no, we can't take this back because it's missing the cable. And it, I said, oh, here's another cable. And they're like, oh, it's not exactly the same. If we don't send it back exactly, we don't get credit for it. And the reality is they're worried that they're going to be a problem for Apple. They don't want Apple to say, you're not worth the, you're not worth the effort. Like I don't need to be in your channel you know, you're already, you know, kind of packaging some stuff together and, and, you know, being cheaper than other sellers because of that, we're, we're just going to pass and, and walk away from the business. So they're very careful. They're on their tippy toes, making sure they don't violate any, uh, any map pricing or, um, uh, return procedures and so forth, because, you know, Apple's, Apple's the 800 pound gorilla. They have all the control. So Costco though, they'll, they'll do unique uh, packaging. They'll, they'll put two things together or three things together, or it's instead of 17 ounces, it's 15 ounces or, or, or something like that, just so mm -hmm. that they, the brand wants to make the brand feel comfortable. Hey, we're not competing against the other guy because it's technically not the exact same product. And, and it also prevents uh, sometimes price comparing uh, to see, I mean, Costco is yeah. a great company and they, they do things well, but they make money. So don't, don't, uh, don't think, don't think they're not making money. And there's a lot of creative ways that they, they make money. There's a really good podcast called, a, uh, I think it's called acquired where they do about a three and a half hour, four hour, uh, talk about Costco and the, their entire business model. And it's fascinating to actually get into that and just to, to mm -hmm. hear exactly how all those levers are working, that they, they make this, they make it work. They have an exact science to it. I mean, you look at footprint, they're basically the same size footprint as Sam's Club with twice the revenue and uh, their profit margins. I think last time they reported was like 12.7% uh, margins, but they've got a loyal customer base that's paying them a membership fee and they're, they're, they're partnering with people that are selling something a little different for them so they can pass on value without being disruptive to the brand. And that's something that I think a lot of people that are brands that are, are not really thinking through. And that's something we help them understand is, okay, you want to start selling on Amazon? 
but you're also selling in Best Buy and Walmart and other places, don't offer the exact same thing. Offer a slightly different variant so that Amazon doesn't price match what happens when Walmart drives a price you know, promotion or, or Best Buy drives a price promotion or something. And now Amazon has either followed with the uh, pricing uh, if they take their own price actions, which they can do, um, or uh, they will suppress your product because it doesn't, um, you know, it, it violates their market marketplace fair pricing uh, policy. And uh, it can really be problematic. So if you can have a slightly different variant, let's say you're selling supplements. One, one channel, you're selling a 90-day supply. One, you're selling a 120-day supply. Costco, you're selling a 200-day supply, whatever. You differ it so that there are different price points that are attractive to different customers and um, oftentimes it's kind of right size for the customer's expectations. You know, you can go to, you can go to a, a grocery store and buy a two liter bottle of soda, or you can buy a can of soda in a vending machine, or you go to a sports game and you pay an outrageous amount for a, a soda. And the consumers un understand that they're buying different portion sizes and different levels of convenience at different prices. And oftentimes that is underutilized by, by brands, if you ask me. I agree. Sometimes, sometimes a consumer doesn't realize it. I mean, you, consumers going to know the difference between a two hundred uh, bottle of two hundred supplements versus sixty. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's subtle. It's like at Walmart. If you go get a, I don't know, one of these protein power bars, you know, maybe it's usually sold in a box of six, but at Walmart it's a box of five, uh, and that way it actually yeah. looks like it's a lower price, but it's also less less quantity. And a lot of times, you know, customers looking at the ad. Uh, uh, at the ad in the Sunday paper, if they still do that, and some of Walmart's customers still look at the, the ads in the Sunday mm -hmm. paper, um, mm -hmm. they're like, "Oh, that's a box for uh, three twenty-seven versus uh, on on Amazon, it's four nineteen. Uh, this is a this is a good deal." When actually, when you break it down on a per unit basis, is actually maybe not such a good deal. Um, and mm -hmm. but they they don't they don't perceive that. So perception is reality a, a lot of times in, in marketing. Uh, it, it, and so a lot, of, I, I agree with you. A lot of brands mm -hmm. miss that. Costco and Sam's Club are really known for that. I have a subscription or a membership with Bolt, and I bought uh, this mat for my workout area, um, and it was cheaper at Sam's Club, but it had less quantity than Costco. So the initial gut instinct is, oh, it's cheaper at Sam's Club until you realize the package contained there's these are like squares that you like pop together yeah. that are padded, and it contained less squares. I didn't happen to need more squares, so it was the better value for me was at Sam's Club. But if you needed more, the true value was actually better at Costco on a per square basis. And customers uh, really aren't as savvy as we might give them credit to you a lot of times. And they don't pick up on that. So you have to pick what is the key price point for your product in each channel and how do I be attractive there? And, and there's also ways to do it without even variating it at all, really, just different packaging. You know, Amazon has frustration free packaging. That could be a different product altogether than something that, that you're selling in Walmart, Target or or elsewhere. Um, and if you are really determined to make it clear to Amazon's algorithms that it's a different product, they won't match it. The, the problem is a lot of people put up their product on their website and they, they have a real simple short title. They don't put the UPC, they don't put the part number, they just tell you what it is. And Amazon might match to that and think it's a six pack or they might think it's a, you know, a, you know some other variant because they're matching to the wrong item. Um, so it's really important to make sure you put your UPC code, your part number, any kind of quantity count. And, and then Amazon, uh, if you can show, hey, this is different, even with different UPC and different part number, they may not match it because they don't see it as exact like items. Is that one way? Is that maybe this is a little hack here? Is that a, way, a workaround that you see people use where you want to sell it on your website for $19.99, but you want to sell it on Amazon for $29.99, but you don't mm -hmm. want Amazon to... Uh, take the buy box away because their their cron jobs are out there scouring their spiders are out there sp scouring the internet and find your 1999 one if i just put a different upc if it's the exact same product and i either i i put a different upc on the box or maybe i don't even have to put a upc on the box i can just pay for or get a, a second upc and just list that and just maybe it's the same upc in my warehouse but who cares uh it never goes into amazon is is yeah, what Amazon is. Still, still pick up on that? Or is can that actually, is it UPC first? Uh, or do they actually say, okay, these are different UPCs, but the title's exactly the same, the description's exactly the same. This looks like a, a dead on match. So my experience with this has been that you can't just variate one thing, you gotta variate multiple. So the title should be slightly different, the image. So let, maybe maybe on Amazon, your, your image is just the bottle and on your website, it's the box 
uh, with the bottle inside it as the main image. And then the title's slightly different. Uh, of course, your price is different. That's kind of the point of it. And your part number, uh, I would also differ as well. And, and UPC. UPC is something that Amazon's not necessarily looking for as much because a lot of people don't put it on there, but it's a, it's a higher confidence level because a UPC shows it's a different variant. And, you know, they don't want to compare apples to oranges. Their system's just not that good at deciphering it sometimes. And uh, sometimes you need to do this effort just to keep them from making a mistake when they're truly like you're selling singles that yet you on Amazon, you sell a six pack and they say, oh no, it's too expensive. It's, it's against our marketplace fair pricing policy. No, it's not. It's different items. And in other cases, it's so that you can truly sell at a different price kind of without Amazon catching on. Now, you mentioned earlier, uh, Nike is a good example of, of a brand that was selling on Amazon and doing well. And then they're like, to heck with this. We don't want to be associated with Amazon. They pulled everything off and now they're back. Yeah. Can you walk us through uh, what happened there and explain um, a little bit of what, what the logic was and what the process was and what happened there? Yeah. So it, basically, Nike was, um, you know, they were resistant to Amazon for a long time. Amazon convinced them to sell to them. And Amazon made a bunch of promises that they would control the channel. And, and if you, if you become our, a brand that sells to us directly, we'll, we'll control the channel and make sure that your brand's better represented. And I think you know, these are based on assumptions, based on looking at it from the outside in, uh, is that Nike didn't get what they were promised, essentially, that the, their free market policies still allowed sellers to sell the brand and there wasn't enough done to make the brand more premium or set aside or or whatever. And Amazon or Nike had an aspiration to have, I think it was like 50% of all of their business through direct to consumer. So they they said, no, we're walking away from Amazon. Uh, they, they did that thinking all of those customers would shift over and buy from their D2C channel. The reality is that just doesn't happen the way brands think. And here we are, you know, two years later or something, I don't remember exactly what what period of time it was, but Nike's back. Nike said, okay, we're, we need to sell on this channel because their stock price dropped. The D2C initiatives did not pan out as they anticipated. And I always like to remind brands, don't, don't neglect the channel. Don't, don't, just, don't just say, no, I'm not going to sell there and I don't care what happens there. That's the wrong thing to do. And that's essentially what Nike did. They, they thought if they leave that you know, basically the consumer is going to realize, realize that Nike's not selling all of their products there and they're just going to find the product. But there's a lot of customers that might favor Nike, but they're on Amazon just searching for gym shorts or athletic t-shirt or, you know, sack pack or whatever it is that has a Nike brand uh, offering, but it's just not there anymore. They're going to gravitate towards the competitors or they're going to gravitate towards other third-party sellers. And if you looked at the period of time when Amazon uh, and Nike did not have a partnership there was a, a huge amount. I don't want to misquote the number, but I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of products that were being offered um, by uh, unauthorized sellers. So instead of the brand looking good and being attractive to the customers that are already inherently shopping on Amazon and they're just determined to make a purchase on Amazon and they don't want to be inconvenienced to leave, then um, they were not seeing the product and they were choosing in a lot of cases alternative products. Now, if you were looking for a Nike Air Jordan, and you don't go and find it on Amazon, you're probably going to look for it elsewhere because it's something iconic that you really want. But that's just not the reality for the vast majority of your product sales. And what I like to say is these brands should embrace the, 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 the traffic and visibility that they can get in a, in a marketplace like Amazon, but control it. If you avoid it, now it becomes the Wild West. But if you embrace it and say, okay, I don't really want to be there, but X percent, I mean, Amazon's like 39% of all e-commerce sales. You can't avoid that anymore. Um, so you really need to be there, but control the brand with a good brand store, A plus content, videos, like really present your brand well. Maybe be the only seller on Amazon. So there's not a lot of competition. And 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 then just uh, you can you can throttle it. You don't have to offer everything. You don't have to, you know, be cheaper. You don't have to do things to accelerate it. But at least you're doing business on Amazon under your terms, not Amazon's terms or a bunch of third party sellers that are, you know, kind of uh, hacking it, you know, essentially. I had a brand experience where I, I got into dabbled in licensing for a little while. So I actually we got the license in the pet space for Body Glove, you know, the surfing company, Body Glove that does the surfboards. And, yeah. and we ended up doing uh, dog. We developed an entire line of life jackets for dogs. 
uh, with I remember. The, yeah. the body glove logo on it. And we, we came out, <clears throat> came out with that product thinking that, all right, uh, this is a brand name. This should differentiate. This should uh, really help us. We got a big brand behind it. They made all these promises that we got these influencers and these athletes. They have a million followers. They'll promote it on social media. So we got all excited. None mm-hmm. of that came to fruition. They didn't promote it worth squat. Um, and like, like they had promised, we put it up on, on Amazon and did you know the normal marketing and launching and all that. And this thing, we just could not sell it. Um, it, it just was, I mean, the people that the people did buy it. But what I learned off of that is that there are, all brands should probably have a presence on Amazon, but there are brands that are going to do better uh, and brands that are not going to do as good. And, and in the case of Body Glove, what I, kind of a little formula that I came out with is like, you're not really a brand, not, whether you're your own brand or you're a, on, on Amazon, unless you have 3,000 or more searches, branded searches per month. That's kind of just a little rule that I said. Mm-hmm. So going forward, if I was going to do another licensing deal with somebody, I would first, I did not do this on the body glove one, I just assumed, but on, on body glove, I, I looked at keywords for life jackets and dog life jackets, all that kind of stuff, but not the branded ones. And body glove did not have a lot of search on Amazon. Um, so piggybacking off of that brand's name on Amazon uh, by paying a licensing fee was not going to be a, a major advantage to us. And so there, there are some times where there are certain brands that just, they just don't work on Amazon. You look at, um, you look at some of the, the kitchen categories, KitchenAid and, you know, OXO mm-hmm. and some of those big brands that are in, they were in the, when Bed Bath & Beyond existed, they were in there, they're in all the targets and they, they do really well. But on Amazon, they're not, a lot of times not even on page one of search results for their, some of their top products. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think is, is the reason behind some of this? So I think it's where the consumers think to buy their product. Um, when I think of certain brands, I think of, you know, buying them at a specialty retailer, not uh, uh, an online marketplace like Amazon. Um, or I don't even realize that they sell the type of products that they may market. So for example, there are a couple brands in restaurants that, they don't do a good job selling the the products that customers want to buy, like Chick Fil A, Whataburger. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of different examples like that where the consumers don't realize that, let's say, Chick Fil A sauce is available to buy. They they love it. They go to the Chick they go to Chick Fil A restaurant and they they ask for it by name because it's so favored to them. But they don't realize I can buy it uh, in retail. Well, on Amazon, there's searches for it. Um, that are maybe not as great as you would imagine um, because consumers don't think to buy that. That would be a good example like Body Glove. They're not thinking to buy on that channel. But Mm -hmm. when consumers do think to buy on that or when they do search on that channel, even in limited quantity, the assortment that they see is not controlled by the brand and it's a very bad experience. It's usually overpriced. We're talking two to four times higher by resellers that are going in and buying it at Walmart uh, and reselling it on Amazon. And these brands just have their clueless that this is an opportunity that is uh, something we could actually get behind and tell people when they walk into a Chick-fil-A store, but, you know, there's a, a window label. Don't forget your Chick-fil-A sauce. Sell it at the stores. Like tell them, hey, you can buy it online, Chick-fil-A.com and, and also available on Amazon and let them you know, buy it while they're sitting there waiting for their food or whatever. Um, there's, there's just a lot of brands that They've never executed to allow customers to know that they're in support of, you know, consumers buying their product online and especially on Amazon. And if they were to, to initiate a, a, a social media campaign, letting people know that their product's available on these channels, get it whenever they want it, um, I think it would really succeed and people would start searching for it on Amazon. But it's just not ingrained in them to say that's where I should buy it. What other channel right now do you think in, in dealing with all your clients besides Amazon is the, is the hot opportunity? I mean, TikTok is the buzzword right now, mm-hmm. but there's questions, is TikTok going to make it or not uh, under uh, regulatory rules and stuff? So some people mm-hmm. are a little gun shy on that, but mm-hmm. where you, or is it, is it Walmart? Maybe walmart.com is the next, it's, it's emerging. I mean, their sales were a hundred billion, I think uh, last year compared to Amazon's uh, GMB of like uh, on, pro, uh, was it 700 or something like that? Um, and but out of that hundred billion on Walmart, only ten billion of it was third party sellers. The other ninety was Walmart's, you know, their own wholesale division, uh, home yeah. home buying division. So that's pretty small. Or you look at TikTok. I think last year was fifteen billion is what they reported was their sales, which is a, a, a prime day for Amazon. It's one day of the year for Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you see as emerging? Uh, Amazon's still the big gorilla, but what do you see as the next uh, 
emerging place or hot place that people need to pay attention to? So I think social media in general is something you've got to be paying attention to. And, and it, it, like I, I told you, be where your customers are spending your time and money. If your customers are engaging with your brand through influencers, make sure that you have transactional capabilities through there. It doesn't have to be TikTok shop. It could be linking to, to Amazon and making a purchase, but either way, you should be trying to transact um, whenever customers are wanting to, to buy from you. Um, Walmart is a, a category that, boy, there's, I just feel like people have neglected it, even though they're doing a lot of the right things. Like I like to buy from Walmart when I know that I can place an order and someone's going to come to my door and drop off a bag at my doorstep, like same day. I, I, it's a level of service for if something's sold in their stores, that's beyond what Amazon can offer. And I can return it at the store easily. Um, it it kind of makes sense. And I feel like a lot of sellers are just neglecting it or more commonly saying, I, I tried it, it didn't work. Or I, yeah, I sell there, but I, it doesn't produce any revenue. Well, if you lift and shift your category from Amazon or your catalog from Amazon to Walmart, you're probably not gonna succeed. Their algorithms are way different. Like you've gotta have good reviews. There's different ways you can ingest the reviews into Walmart. Um, like uh, Bizarre Voice and other partners, review partners can, can allow you to synchronize reviews there um, from your website. Um, you've got to have WFS or other two day or, or faster shipping. It's really important to Walmart. And you've got to train their, you know, got to kind of work towards their algorithms. They like short, sweet titles, uh, bullet points to be much more succinct, descriptions to be longer. Um, the Amazon, I mean, Walmart has a listing quality score that they will basically spell it out what needs to change. And you can go in there and make changes in your listing and see the score go up right before your eyes, essentially. It's not immediate, but it's it's very fast. And you can say, oh, that didn't work. I'm going to revise it a little further. And you you need to kind of have the right attributes in place and the right categorization and the right you know aspects to succeed. And if until you've done that, you, you really don't know what the potential is. Now, I will say I've seen great success. Like some of our clients do millions of dollars on Walmart and you know, and, and they, they really succeed at it. And others, it is, it's just a small percentage of their Amazon sales. And part of it is because their, their product, just like we talked about uh, some other brands that just have limited search volume, the consumer doesn't think to buy it on Walmart. Like you're not going to succeed as much on Walmart if you're a more premium brand, a higher price point. But if you're a lower price point, more value oriented product, uh, something that it might not be something that they expect to be in Walmart, but the category they expect to be in Walmart. And then you can have pretty good success there. Uh, but Target uh, and Walmart, I think, are two domestic partners that um, there's just not a lot of utilization, but I still think there's a lot of upside there. And we're seeing a lot of real growth come from uh, Amazon International, uh, UK and Germany most dominantly. But really, you know, over time on your roadmap, you should have a plan to sell it all of Amazon's international marketplaces. And surprisingly, it can be uh, different than you might anticipate. You might say, oh, well, you know, if I move international, I'm gonna go in UK because it's English speaking and it's one of the largest marketplaces, but you might actually find that you, you have this huge pent up demand in Japan because your products are really highly desired there and there's not a lot of sellers selling your product. Do the research so you know, where do I need to, you know, how do I need to roadmap this out? Well, this uh, we've been talking for a little bit here. We could keep going, I think, for a couple more hours. Uh, but uh, this this has been uh, been good, uh, Steve. I, I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing today. Great uh, great conversation. If people want to learn more about uh, what you guys do or reach out to you, or uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, they can uh, go to primeguidance.com, uh, which is our website. You can also email me directly at steve at primeguidance.com uh, or text me at nine seven two five zero five. Uh, 1647. Be happy to uh, set up a free call to kind of evaluate your listings, talk shop, uh, whatever, you know, just just to, to get to know you and uh, and share some thoughts with you about your brand. And if it's a fit for us to help you, we'd love to help you. Appreciate it, Steve. Fellow Texan, to another fellow uh, Texan. Uh, giddy up. <laughs> <laughs> giddy up. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on.
You know, a lot of podcasters, when they sit down and create the podcast, they have a set of interview questions that they do. Sometimes they even send it to the, the guest in advance. But here at AMPM Podcast, we don't do any of that. Every single podcast is completely ad-libbed. A lot of times the guest will come on, like today, Steve's like, what do you want to talk about? I like, I don't know. We're going to go wherever we go. And that's the way I run the AMPM Podcast. There's no prep work in advance. There's no list of questions that we got to get through. It's just we're going to have two guys or a guy and a gal uh, talk and shop. And that's just the way it works. And so I hope you enjoy the way we do this AMPM podcast because I think it's uh, you're like a fly on the wall. You're like being in a conversation. It doesn't feel like an interrogation or something or painful like a lot of our podcasts do. So as you can see, the conversation with Steve today went uh, really well. We talked about a lot of really cool stuff and had no idea we we're going to talk about any of that uh, before we started the podcast. We'll be back again next week with another awesome episode, episode 414. You don't want to miss this one. It's a couple, and their story about what happened the day they went to sell their businesses, literally the day that, that Thrasio was going to wire them multiple millions of dollars, they had to call the deal off because their listing got suspended. And the story about how they got it unsuspended is amazing. It's really cool. You don't want to miss this episode. It's going to be really cool, really enlightening. And they talk about what they've done next and how they bought a $2 million brand for 40000 bucks, and are now just growing the heck out of it. Fascinating stuff. So make sure to tune in next week for the AM PM podcast number 414. We'll be back again with that episode. But before we leave you, I've got some parting words for you. You know, if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. But if you are determined to learn, then no one can stop you. See you again next week.